Dr. Susan Pineda Mercado has led a distinguished career in medicine and public health for more than 30 years. She's overseen the response to some of the most complex challenges of public health today and is now Executive Director of Health and Humanitarian Action. Dr. Mercado joins us now from Manila. Dr. Mercado, as a trained physician and public health professional, can you explain how rising temperatures as a result of the climate crisis can increase the threat and spread of diseases? Let's talk about the individual first. Um, when an individual is exposed to extreme heat, uh, what happens is blood is shunted from the internal organs of the body, mm -hmm. the blood vessels dilate, and uh, that's, that's an, an adaptation or a way of the body to cool off from the heat. But when that happens, then you have less oxygen going to the internal organs, including the brain, the heart, the kidneys, the liver, and that can cause heat exhaustion, which makes a person feel dizzy, um, uh, lose balance, feel like uh, one has no stamina, and ultimately a person could actually faint or lose consciousness because of lack of blood going to the internal organs of the body. Now, the other part of it, of course, is that uh, extreme temperature impacts on the environment, and we are heavily dependent on the environment for food and water. Mm -hmm. So in both cases, it depends on the sensitivity of individuals. So for example, older persons in particular are more sensitive to heat. Their bodies are not able to thermoregulate. The brain is not able to regulate the heat of the body. Or people with mental health issues, for example, are very sensitive to heat. There's sensitivity, there's the exposure, how long one is exposed to heat, and then the ability of a person to adapt. Knowing what to do when it is too hot will determine whether or not you could survive extreme heat. Now, the region around the Philippines gets an average of 20 typhoons per year, and climate change is, is expected to continue to lead to stronger storms. So, though not all of them make landfall, which communities are most vulnerable to the effects of these disasters? You know, our country is one of the worst hit uh, countries in the world in terms of, of storms. And um, I would say that about two thirds or about 66 million people are at risk in this country because 66 million people live in coastal areas. Half of all our, our smaller cities and all of the major cities of the Philippines are in coastal areas. So these are all very vulnerable areas to rising uh, to storms and rising sea levels. But of course, it is the poor who are the most vulnerable because they live in the worst parts of the environment. Well, since the devastating typhoon Haiyan in 2013, what development programs are in the works to design and build more climate resistant evacuation shelters? I've been working with the Philippine Red Cross for more than a year, and recently I visited some of the um, evacuation centers, some of the new homes that have been built, and some of the retrofitting of homes for people who were displaced by Haiyan. So there are, recently we built about 80,000 houses, new houses that are resilient to climate, and um, evacuation centers as well that can be used as multipurpose halls, are, can be seen all over the uh, Leyte and Summer region. Now, there are many other initiatives of other organizations and the government itself, but there is a uh, very acute awareness of the need to have infrastructure that is resilient to floods and to storms. Now, doctor, if you could tell us about some of the resettlement sites, what are conditions like and are there efforts in place to ensure water quality, sanitation, and energy efficiency for the displaced population? Again, I've been visiting the Red Cross resettlement sites and all of them have safe water, uh, latrines have been put up, and in fact, drainage systems have been put up. And we've talked to certain heads of communities who have said that they have lived in these communities that have always flooded, but since drainage and new infrastructure has been put up, they are no longer seeing any floods. Now, this is not true all over the country. And in fact, people are still living in areas where they could be inhaling uh, fumes from cooking beside where they are resettled. So there is a variation across the country in terms of our ability to have good resettlement sites. 
Now, how are the survivors in the resettlement sites coping with displacement? Uh, is there a struggle with depression or anxiety? Filipinos are very resilient. And um, again, I was in Tacloban last week, and there was a, a little joke they were saying was that one cannot run faster than water. And so they talk about running water as something you cannot outrun. And I think while people have suffered a lot, lots of lives have been lost, and many families are recovering from the devastation of Haiyan, still with a lot of pain, with a lot of anxiety, with a lot of depression. Groups have come in to provide social support. I think faith-based groups have done their job. There have been um, uh, organized, um, organized efforts in communities to provide livelihood for people to have recreation. So it is a slow process coming back and getting out of the depression, the anxiety of being in a major disaster. But there is resilience in our, among our people. And I think this is something that uh, it, it's just about hope. It's about being able to build back better and to recover from great adversity. Okay, what support is in place to help women, children, and other vulnerable people who are in the Philippines and have been affected by the recent storms, whether it be physical or mental health support? There have been extensive trainings on psychological first aid and um, providing people with opportunities to talk about their experience and to um, process what has happened to them. I've seen multiple types of these initiatives uh, in the Haiyan areas. And uh, the Department of Social Welfare and Development has in place community support programs for people. So schools are also stepping up. We are, we are actually working on climate resilient schools. So these are like, uh, what, what would I say, basic resources that people have for vulnerable groups in the country. Now, there are a lot of innovative tools available, solar energy backpacks for one. How are they being used to improve conditions for people in disaster areas? Many uh, civil society groups are using new okay. forms of sustainable or renewable energy in these areas because there are uh, hard to reach areas where you may need, you may need uh, energy but would not have electricity. So for example, in clinics, one could use uh, solar backpacks for you know, minor surgical procedures. If someone is going to deliver a baby, one could bring uh, a backpack, a solar backpack, and use that for fundamental or basic health services. And this is something that's gaining popularity among health groups outside of the government. I've seen more of it happening outside of the government. And these innovations used by civil society groups, advocates, and non-government organizations are bringing services to people where they do not have energy. Thank you, Dr. Susan Pineda-Mercado.